Genesis chapter 19, and, and just kind of getting a running start into our text, we kind of had to break off midstream last Sunday. We're just going to read a bunch of verses, kind of get into the moment, into the momentum. That way, if you weren't here last week, you kind of know where we are in the flow of the chapter. So let's just look at verse 1. We're going to read about 16 verses and then get to where we left off last Sunday. So we're told that two angels who have just left Abraham... They come to Sodom in the evening. Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom, Lot being Abraham's nephew. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them. He bowed himself with his face towards the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night. Wash your feet. Rise early. Go your way. But they said, No, we're going to spend the night in the open square. But Lot insisted strongly. So they turned into him and entered his house. He made them a feast, baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now before they laid down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and he said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See, now I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you. You may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, stand back. And they said, this one came, speaking of Lot, to stay here. And he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. The men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. And the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord and the Lord sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons, sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. So morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while Lot lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to them, they were brought out, set him outside of the city. In addition to Lot, his wife, his two virgin daughters who are living in his home, it kind of seems from the text that he had at least another married daughter, a son-in-law, sons-in-laws, could be plural, in addition to an unspecified number of sons. Lot had quite a family living in Sodom. Now how tragic is it really? that not only do these children refuse to heed Lot's warning, that God was going to destroy the city of Sodom, but they reject what he had to say based on a belief that Lot was just joking around. He's not kidding. He's like, get up, and you can hear the pleading. Get out of this place, but they laugh. How sad it is that Lot had such an impoverished witness that in the moment where he needed his kids to hear him the most, they refused to listen. They don't believe him. What a sad indictment beyond that, that the angels, when it's all said and done, they have to, look at the text, take hold of their hands. They have to grab them and forcibly bring them outside of the city. Lot, Lot's wife, and his two daughters. Even knowing God's judgment was nigh, We're given this sad statement that Lot lingered. Well, on one side of the coin, this conveys just such a sad state of affairs as it pertains to this man, Lot. However, on the flip side of the coin, looking at it from a different angle, this act of God forcibly taking him out of the house, man, it does demonstrate for us kind of an incredible manifestation of God's grace, right? That while Lot lingered, the Lord Lord still chose to be merciful to him. If justice, justice, if justice is getting what you deserve, if that's how we would define justice, getting what you deserve, 
And grace is getting what you don't deserve. Then it's mercy when God chooses to not give you what you do deserve. I think most of us would have seen God sending angels to warn Lot that there was a judgment coming, that that would have been sufficient. But even when Lot and his family end up dragging their feet, when you and I would have been like, good grief, man. Peace, deuces, man, I'm out. You want to leave? You want to stay? Whatever. I've done my part. But these angels are like, no, 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 no. The Lord wants us to be merciful. He wants you to be saved. He grabs hold. They take them out of the city so that they would escape judgment. What grace. Look at verse 17. So it came to pass. When they had brought them outside, that he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to the angels, Please know, my lords. Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight. And you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. Keep in mind, he's a city slicker. So now this city is near enough to flee to. It's a little city. Please let me escape there, and my soul shall live. (laughs) Judgment. Judgment is coming. And everyone, and absolutely everything that Lot knew, that he found familiar, it would either die or be utterly and completely destroyed. This is what's about to go down. The clock is running. They're fleeing the city. It's like the atomic bomb. The counter is is descending. Jack Bauer's nowhere to be found. It's going to happen. Judgment is going to come. They get out of the city, right? And what is Lot most concerned with? He's concerned with what his life is going to look like after they escape. Think about the audacity of Lot. As they're fleeing the city, and the angels are taking him to the mountains. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Not the mountains. Man, how about a city, right? Like, do we really need to go there? Like, he begins to argue with them about where he's going to go. Not the fact that, man, I'm so grateful that I've just been saved. Like, what did he think God was going to, to do? That God was going to save him from destruction, to lead him into the, into, into the wilderness so he could be eaten by a mountain lion? Like he's just, it reveals that he just doesn't know the nature of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord, the providence of the Lord. It just reveals uh, there's, just, there's something missing, right, with Lot. Well, verse 21, the angel said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken, Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city, the small city Lot wants to go to, was called Zor. God capitulates. He's like, all right, you're not going to go to the mountains. You want to go to this little city. Okay, I'll spare that little city. Just get out of here, Lot. Come on. Did you notice this phrase? I love this phrase. I have favored you. That phrase, favored favored you. The King James Version translates this as, I have accepted thee. (laughs) Why was Lot being saved? Was he being saved because he was a real good man, a real good guy, a real upstanding moral citizen? No. Why was Lot being saved? Because God was gracious. Was Lot being saved because he was deserving? No, he lingered. Or the fact that God loved him and wanted to be merciful. Like, keep in mind, and this is so important to the greater context of what's about to play out in our, in our, our passage, but Lot was saved as a work of God's grace and his grace alone. He didn't deserve it. He hadn't earned it. He's clearly not maintaining it. 
He's resisting every step along the way, and yet God still is deciding to be gracious. Well, God's mercy would be evident in the fact that he hadn't, that he didn't allow Lot to perish in the destruction of Sodom, though he lingered. The Lord, through a work of his grace, and this is what blows me away, he has a life planned for Lot. It isn't enough that God was going to spare him judgment, but God wanted Lot to understand that he had a life planned for Lot and his family. As a matter of fact, he had every intention of saving Lot from destruction in order to provide him a life that was better than the one he was leaving behind. God's grace. This is how it comes into play. You know, so many people relegate Jesus' work on the cross as only being a golden ticket to heaven. I pray the prayer, I got the golden ticket, I'm going to heaven, eternal life. That's great. But understand, what Jesus did on the cross is more than a work that just spares you judgment. The truth is that Jesus did much, much more. Jesus didn't die to give you a life then. He died to give you a life today, now, this moment. It's not everlasting life in the future. It's a radical everlasting type of life right now. And oh, isn't that what we need? As a matter of fact, Jesus in John 10 verse 10, what did he say? He said, I came that you may have life, not just in eternity, today, it's present tense, that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. God is not a killjoy. Following God doesn't make your life worse. It might make it harder, but it doesn't make it worse. God calls us, calls us out of a life to lead us into a better life. God's mercy might address your death, but it's his grace that's all about your living. Verse 23, so the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zor. All this is happening that night. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So God overthrew those cities, all in the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, he overthrew even what grew on the ground. Now, a few quick observations as to what's happening here. Archaeological discoveries have, have shown, have demonstrated, the likelihood that Sodom and Gomorrah, located more than likely on the eastern side of what is today the Dead Sea, were ancient cities that, that experienced a very quick and dramatic destruction because of a natural disaster that engulfed this particular region. In fact, the ruins of Zor, this little town that Lot escapes to, have been uncovered. I've included an article at c316.tv where you can read a little bit more of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, where they think it's located, and the artifacts that they've discovered from this town, Zor. And yet, well, what may have happened here was the result of a natural cause. There is no doubt the supernatural involvement and the destruction of these cities is unavoidable. Our passage makes it clear, right? We're told the, the Lord. He might have used some natural destruction, some natural causes, but it was the Lord who actively rained down brimstone and fire on Sodom. And that with these things, we're also told, from the Lord, out of the heavens came this destruction. This is eventually how God is overthrowing these cities. This word overthrow describes a violent overturning. And how did he do it? Well, the source of this destruction was fire and brimstone coming from where? Not from the earth, but coming instead from the heavens. Aside from Jesus affirming the divine element behind these events in Luke chapter 17, in 2 Peter 2, 6, we're also told that God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Peter continues by saying that he did this in order to make them an example to those who would come afterward what it was to live ungodly. 
Jesus' half-brother Jude would later add, this is Jude 1 verse 7, that these cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, while it's entirely possible that God used supernatural event to conti- contribute to their destruction, whatever happened here, our text leaves no room, there is no doubt, that whatever takes place was magnified through God's direct supernatural intervention. You know, it's, it's interesting that it's not an, an accident that in Revelation chapter 20, hell is described as being a lake of fire and brimstone. What occurred to these cities was akin to God raining hell down upon them, maybe even literally. Though I've always <clears throat> equated brimstone. You know, you hear the word brimstone. When I think of brimstone, I've always just kind of seen it as being a molten lava-like substance associated with volcanic activities. But the truth is that no one knows for sure what this word brimstone actually means. Some speculate that the Hebrew word brimstone or gothrith is derived from the Hebrew word gopher, which was a type of ancient wood. If you remember back in Genesis 6, verse 14, it was with gopher wood that God commanded Noah to build the ark with. The logic behind this idea claims that brimstone may have actually been an amber-colored flammable pitch or sap that came from gopher wood. In a sense, brimstone would have been a common fuel or kindling for starting fires in the ancient world. Now, aside from this, what I find even more fascinating about this Hebrew word brimstone is that it's only used, the Hebrew word, it's only used seven times in the Old Testament. And in every single instance, you'll find brimstone associated with the divine judgment of God. Because of this, the Jewish scholars, the Jewish rabbis, they commonly referred to brimstone as simply being Jehovah's breath or God's breath. And and note what the breath of God, this brimstone fueled, it fueled a fire. Or as Jude says, an eternal fire. God's breath coming down from heaven yielded a fire that incinerated these cities. That's what probably the phrase brimstone and fire describes. God going, and a fire coming down and devouring. In a sense, that God's breath fueled the fire, the brimstone. Understand, there are in the Bible two types of fire that we see coming down from heaven supernaturally. There is, on one instance, the fire of judgment. And Sodom and Gomorrah, a really good example of this. God devouring these cities, his breath, the fire, devouring. There's another type of fire, though. The second manifestation of a fire that comes from heaven is a fire of acceptance. Uh, Just as a quick example of this, when Solomon dedicates the temple to show his pleasure, his favor, a fire came from heaven and devoured the, the offering, that first offering. Remember when Elijah had the the holy cook-off with the prophets of Baal? You know, let's barbecue. Uh, You get your altar ready, I'll get mine. The key is we just can't have any fire. We'll just see who's God, you know, is is pleased, who ignites the, you know, consumes the altar. And and, and the prophets of Baal go first, and it fails, and nothing ever happens. And, And to mock them while it's all taking place, Elijah's dumping water on top of his altar. You know, and then he prays, and a fire comes down from heaven and consumes this altar. In both instances, whether it be a fire of judgment, as in Sodom, or the fire of acceptance, fire is always symbolic of purification. In this situation, God's breath and the fire that it fueled cleansed. It purified the earth of the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, their sin was grave. Their outcry was great. But keep in mind, this type of judgment coming from fire is not always the result. When God breathes fire to earth, 
It's not always for judgment. As mentioned, fire from heaven can indicate God's acceptance of a sacrifice, His pleasure, or what we would call in the New Testament, His grace. For just a minute, we don't typically jump around a lot, but I want you to turn to a passage of Scripture with these things in mind. Uh, Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Beginning with verse 1, we read that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, this is 120 uh, followers of Jesus, Jesus has ascended to heaven, has told them to go to Jerusalem and wait. They, these people, were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven As of a rushing mighty wind, in the Greek, this word wind, it's literally breath. A rushing mighty breath. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, with one sitting upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The church is born in this moment. An incredible work of God happens after this. People are hearing the glories of God proclaimed in their own native language, which is trippy because these were all uneducated Galileans. Peter stands up, preaches a sermon. The church is born. We're a part of the work that began on this day. In the Greek, though, this phrase, Holy Spirit. You know, yes, it does refer to the third member of the Holy Trinity. But it's translated in the Greek as hagios pneuma, or literally, The most holy breath of God. That's what the word Holy Spirit means. This day, Pentecost, where this group of 120 followers of Jesus are sitting waiting. They hear a wind, the breath of God. They're filled. And what appears, what results? The appearance of divided tongues as of, think it's an accident, as a fire. Instead of the breath of God, fueling the fire of judgment, brimstone. In this instance, we see God's breath, his pneuma, the Holy Spirit, fueling instead what the fire of God's acceptance. In this moment on Pentecost, God was not judging man with fire as he had done in Sodom. His breath was igniting a fire within the hearts of man, a fire that would burn and change the world. Now quickly go back to Genesis 19 because the symbolism doesn't end there. I want you to notice what resulted from this first recorded fire fueled through the breath of God or brimstone. Verse uh, verse 26, chapter 19, we read, but Lot's wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Now, for context, please keep in mind, the angels had made one thing clear, right, to Lot and his family. Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest your life will be destroyed. They had given a warning, right? Sadly, since Lot's wife refused to obey God's word, the results proved tragic. She looked back and became a pillar of salt. Note the idea in the original language of looking back. Isn't that she just caught a gaze or a glimpse. The idea is that she, in doing this, was, was demonstrating a longing, a, a, a regret, that she wanted to be back. She missed the life she had. Now, what makes this particular woman, Lot's wife, so fascinating is that Jesus specifically brings her up in Luke chapter 17. And this is how he does it. He tells his disciples, and us. He says, remember Lot's wife, adding, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. That's strange. I mean, I mean, take into account that we have here a woman that we know literally nothing about. We aren't given her name, her ethnicity, how old she was, when she married Lot, how they met, her backstory. 
her role in Sodom. We, we don't know anything about Lot's wife. And yet Jesus singles her out and commands us to never forget her, to remember Lot's wife. So what are we to remember? I think the answer is pretty clear. While God's grace had been demonstrated to her in spite of her, God's grace was only as powerful as she allowed it to be. You see, the sad thing is that she looked back, longing for a life that God's grace was seeking to liberate her from. She looked back to a home, a home she had, as opposed to looking forward to the home that God was wanting to give her. The context that Jesus gives for uh, this remembering, that whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, whoever loses his life will preserve it, it indicates an important truth that you and I should never forget. How we respond to God's grace is of eternal significance. David Guzik wrote, quote, we need to look forward to our deliverance, not back, at a world passing away and ripe for judgment. Friend, remember Lot's wife because she illustrates a person who, while knowing of God's grace and even enjoying a small taste or a sample of God's grace, she still perished. Why? Because she failed to go where God's grace wanted to lead her. She looked back. Never forget, God's amazing grace can only lead you as far as you're willing to let it take you or you're willing to go. Charles Spurgeon, the famed pastor, he, he made this observation about this passage. He says, she almost made it. Doom befell her at the gates of Zor. Oh, if I must be damned, let it be with the masses of the ungodly, having always been one of them. But to get up to the very gates of heaven and to perish there will be a most awful thing. You know, aside from all of this, how interesting that this brimstone and fire the fire of judgment emanating from the breath of God resulted in Lot's wife being turned into a pillar of salt. Or more specifically, she became a pillar of salt. She was transformed. Who she was fundamentally, her composition, boom, in that moment, totally transformed. Because she rejected God's grace and the life that he had saved her uh, for, turning back to Sodom, looking back to Sodom. She became this pillar of salt. And this is what blows my mind about the story. It would appear that the fire of judgment and the fire of acceptance, fueled by the breath of God, exists for the same purpose. Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt in order to communicate to the world a warning that we must walk with God according to God's word for his grace to yield its effects in us and through us. And yet, what results when the breath of God ignites a fire in our hearts and our lives? Well, we turn into people of salt for the exact same reason, to let the world know that God's grace provides a better way. How interesting, right? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus commands us, he says to us, he says, you are what? The salt of the earth. Lot's wife rejected God's grace and it became, she became a pillar of salt, immovable. Communicated a lesson. But when God's breath ignites a fire in us, we also, the, the substance of who we are, we're transformed into people of salt, alive, moving, and living, going throughout the world as flavor, seasoning, letting the world know that God has a better, a better way. Well, verse 27. Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold the smoke of the land, which went up like a smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out 
of the midst of the overthrow. When he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt, Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zor, and he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Lot's entire life has been completely and utterly thrown into disarray. Everything that he knew had been completely destroyed. Total devastation. His home, community, friends, along with an untold number of his children, had all been caught up in the judgment. And then to make matters worse, his wife was turned into a pillar of salt. He had to watch it happen. We're told here that though Lot did make it to Zor as he had requested, he's afraid of something. Like he fears that, you know what, after seeing what just happened, maybe going to a city was a poor choice. Maybe this judgment might also come here. I don't want to get caught up in it. So, all right, I should have listened to the Lord to begin with. Girls, pack your bags. We're getting out of Zor. And what does he do? He flees into the mountains like God originally wanted him to. The text tells us that he and his two daughters dwell in a cave. And this is where the story gets weird. Strange. Bizarre. Verse 31. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old. There is no man on the earth to come into us, as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night. The firstborn went in and laid with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose, which means he's pretty toasted. And it happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I laid with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also that you may go in and lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also. The younger arose and laid with him. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son, called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. This is Moses giving us some context. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name ben Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. Now, there's no way around it. And not even the creator of Game of Thrones would dare go so far. But this story, Genesis, God's Word, chapter 19, it takes kind of an incestuous turn for the worse. Fearing that that maybe they were the only people alive left on earth, which is possible, or that they just needed to preserve their father's lineage, which is also possible. Either way, the daughters here, they concoct this plan. They're going to get their father hammered, date rape him, so that they could each have a son. I mean, that is literally what the text is telling us happened. And these two sons, on a side note, Moab, Ammon, they would become the enemies of the Israelites, the people of God. Now, what's so sad about all of this is this is the final detail we're given of Lot's life. I mean, it's kind of like that that's what's put on his tombstone. That his daughters got him drunk, date raped him, and had kids. Is that the last memory you want of you for all of eternity? Oh yeah, he did a lot of things, but yeah, at the end it got really weird. No. But that's it. Like, that's the end of this story. I don't think I'm going out on a limb here to say that that Lot, his life ended. He ended as a man defeated, dejected, and depressed. You know, originally, it had been materialism that had driven a wedge between he and his uncle Abraham. Driven a wedge so deep, in fact, that even when Abe saved Lot and his family when they had been taken captive by Chedlamar, this was in Genesis 14, Lot still chose, instead of hanging out with Abraham again, to just go back to Sodom. The text, Scripture, gives us no indication that Lot and Abraham ever reconciled their relationship. He dies 
a broken man separated from his friend, his family, his brother. Beyond this, Lot lost his family entirely. Although, I guess you could make the argument he had lost them before the judgment of Sodom. You see, the truth is Lot standing before some of his children was so poor that they laughed at his warning that God's judgment was coming. They laughed at him. They didn't take him seriously. The life he lived was of the such that when he needed his kids to listen to him the most, they didn't believe. They didn't believe a word he said. Then to make matters worse, instead of running, hand in hand with his wife from Sodom, I don't know if you noticed it, but we're told that she first fell behind him. He allowed her to fall behind him. The pain when he realized that her love for the world was greater than her love for God or her love for he. Lot watched her get swallowed up with the judgment of God, watched her go down with the ship, and there was nothing he could do. I can also imagine that in addition to his own children perishing, Lot maybe blamed himself for her death. You know, I mean, think about it. If Lot had been originally obedient, go to the mountains, destruction's coming. If he had just gone to the mountains, no, what did he do instead? He said, no, 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 no. we want to go to Zor. And it's because they took this elongated detour that she looked back. She had time. I can imagine Lot if it had been me. If I had just listened initially, at the beginning, maybe she would have never even had the opportunity to look back. Maybe she would still be with me. (laughs) How terrible that in the end, even the two daughters who do survive demonstrate zero respect for Lot. Sure, they're all afraid. You get that. They don't know really what's happened. They haven't read Genesis 19. But does Lot do anything to calm their fears? We don't have it recorded. Does he comfort them with the knowledge that by God's grace, he would sustain them? Do they pray? Now, he could have gone to Abraham, couldn't he? Now, the sad thing is, while I don't think Lot would have willingly The text is pretty clear that that he didn't know when they lay down, when they got up. I don't think he would have slept with his daughters willingly, knowingly. But you know, he's culpable. Because he did allow himself to get hammered so far beyond the point that when he woke up, he had to have known something occurred. And he allowed this to happen twice. Back to back nights. You know, with just a couple minutes we have left, I want you to consider what transpired and the life of a man who had begun with such potential, but seemed to squander all of it. You see, the story of Lot, of his life, it's a tragedy, mainly because it didn't have to end this way. It didn't have to turn out. Like, don't forget, to his credit, Lot followed Abraham from Ur, then followed him from Haran. Lot followed Abraham to the land of promise. He believed as well. How in the world did things end up so poor? You can understand that Scripture presents for us an interesting progression in the lot of life, and in, in, in the, the progression of Lot's life. We haven't pointed it out yet because I wanted to wait to this moment. But back in Genesis 13, when he and Abraham decide to part ways, we're told that Lot lifted his eyes and saw the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So he chose for himself all of the plain of the Jordan, journeyed east, dwelling in the cities of the plain. Then, then we're told, pitching his tent even as far as Sodom. They know the wickedness of Sodom. And he pitches his tent as far as Sodom. Then in Genesis 14, the next time we see Lot, what's, what, what's happening? Lot is now actually dwelling in Sodom. His tent pitched towards Sodom. Now he's in Sodom. And then in chapter 19, the first verse we read, how does the scene open? Lot is now sitting in the gate towards Sodom, then in Sodom, before ultimately sitting in the gate of Sodom. Which indicates, by the way, that Lot had come to a position of power, of influence, of notoriety, probably in all likelihood because his his uncle had saved them from destruction. And while this progression toward Sodom, in Sodom, and the gate of Sodom, while this progression indicates that Lot's life unraveled, 
because of compromise. I mean, there is no doubt that he flirted with the world and in the process lost his moral standing and the lives of his wife and his children, that he vacated his role to the wickedness of the world around him. Keep in mind, Lot was also a man who, because of his moral compromise, lived in constant spiritual affliction as a result. In 2 Peter 2, we're told that while living in Sodom, Lot thought he could make a difference. As a matter of fact, Peter wrote that Lot was oppressed or literally tired with toil. He was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the world, for that righteous man dwelt among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. You see, because Lot knew the truth, had experienced the grace of God, was aware that the Lord had for him a higher calling, Lot's compromise with the world only yielded a constant conflict within himself. Christian, know that while compromise with the world promises to minimize your conflict, Lot's life teaches us that compromise only leads to a deeper unrest within one's soul. While living in Sodom, seeing Sodom, Lot was not happy. He was miserable. He was tormented. He was tired. Why? Because he knew that wasn't where God wanted he and his family to be. And yet, while Lot's life, you look at it, and you're like, that's just, that's terrible. Like, what a bummer. (laughs) The Bible still describes him. Wrap your brain around this. The Bible still describes Lot, in spite of all of the bad things that happened, as being righteous. He's called righteous Lot. Attest to by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Amazingly, though his life ended in disaster, and he lost his entire family, his wife and his children in the process, not to mention his only lasting legacy would be that the two nations that descended from him would oppose the work of God. God still viewed Lot as being a righteous man, a righteous position that he's still in heaven. You know, if there is but one overarching lesson you should learn from the tragedy that was his life, Lot's life, it's this. It is entirely possible to waste a righteous life when we compromise with the world. Lot believed in Jesus and had been declared righteous as a result, and yet, Because of his actions, Lot was ultimately robbed of the joy. He forfeited his moral influence. In the end, he died without leaving any spiritual legacy because of compromise. That was not the life God's grace wanted to give him. God's grace, it proved sufficient to save him. God's grace didn't fail Lot. God's grace saved Lot. Why? Because his righteousness had not been based upon his performance. Same with you. And yet, Lot's life of constant moral compromise, it did limit the life God's grace would have still been sufficient to provide. That is a heavy, radically important one. Especially in a church that touts and declares and reminds and exhorts God's grace. And we do that because we know what God's grace can do in you and through you, not just for eternity, but today. But friend, the only way you can see that life happen is if you let it. Lot's wife wouldn't let grace take her all the way. She turned into a pillar of salt. Lot compromised, and God's grace saved him. But for all of eternity, there's a regret in that man's soul that he wasted. He wasted the life God had given him. May we, may you, may me. None of that's grammatically correct, but... May us never forget 
that God's grace only works if we let it. It only transforms if we allow it. That God will never force anything that we aren't willing to open our hands and receive. And so, Father,